On the regenerative journey, our goal is to nurture and facilitate the lives and journeys of all our followers, which is why we've teamed up with Resource Consulting Service, RCS, Australia's leading provider of education and advisory services in regenerative agriculture. RCS trains and consults across the ag sector from individuals and families through to corporates and even government, empowering people to grow productive and profitable businesses in diverse and, importantly, healthy landscapes. They understand that the future of healthy families, resilient communities and regenerative farming lies in holistic education. Over the last 15 years, they've played an integral role in my own regenerative journey. And I have a lot to thank RCS for, and I'm one of 7,500 others who have attended their farming and grazing for profit course. I don't know where I'd actually be, uh, and I certainly wouldn't be this far down my own regenerative journey if I hadn't completed a significant amount of training with the RCS team. I can't recommend more highly uh, RCS to anyone looking to start their regenerative journey in a supportive and proven environment. Terry, McCosca, and your team, you absolutely rock. And we're also absolutely stoked to be collaborating with them now. For my listeners only, we're offering a 10% discount on all farming and grazing for profit schools and grazing clinics in Australia this year. If you add this to the early bird rate of a seven-day school, you could get a whopping $1,000 off the standard price. Simply add the code CHARLIERCS, that's CHARLIERCS, that's one word, at the checkout to get your concession. How awesome is that? Now head to the show notes to find out more. There's a perception today that that we're on this gravy train that can just continue, and yeah. it can't. You know, the in terms of humans at the moment, we're somewhere between fifty and sixty percent overstocked to the carrying capacity of Earth, and so something something's going to happen in the next few years. Somewhere it could happen tomorrow. It could happen in two years, five years. I don't know when, but um, the gravy train we're on right now is going to come crashing down. That was Terry McCosker, and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. From wherever we are, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, recognising their continuing connection to this land, its waterways, the stars in the skies since time immemorial. We pay our respects to the elders, knowledge holders, and to all the generations of First Nations peoples who have nurtured their unceded sovereign lands for over 80,000 years and continue to do so today. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott, an 8th generational Australian regenerative farmer and in this podcast series I'll be diving deep and exploring my guests' unique perspectives on the world so you can apply their experience and knowledge to cultivate your own transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with your host Charlie Arnott. G'day and welcome back to The Regenerative Journey and this week's episode is with none other than the godfather of regenerative farming in Australia, as I see it, Terry McCosker. It's part one of a marathon three-hour interview I did with Terry a couple of weeks ago in the Brisbane City Botanic Gardens. We sat under a wonderful, huge canopy of a Java almond and um, breathed in the biome of the the Java almond um, and had a lovely chat there. Um, this first part, oh, I'll get to that at the end, actually. Well, what am I going to bang on about now? A quick little plug for the conference, the RCS um, uh, conference, a convergence. It's a convergence of agriculture and human and planetary health on the 16th and 17th of July in 2022, which is this year at the Brisbane Convention and Exhibition Centre in Brisbane or Bris Vegas, to those who are a little more familiar with that part of the world. Um, so... What I was going to talk about today, oh, I just I was thinking about. I was eating almonds before, thinking about what sort of a impact they have on the environment. Uh, I'm not an expert. I do know that um, you know, with the with the sort of a push away from dairy. Uh, I'm just going to keep this conversation simple. Dairy, <clears throat> um, cow cow milk. Actually, well, milk. Let's just call it milk because that's pretty much milk. Um, I don't know. I've got a bit of tr- trouble with uh, challenge by um, calling things, you know, oat milk, almond milk, and so on. Um, but nonetheless, I do not not, not often, but I, I, I do sort of often read and see kind of conversations with um, between people who you know pro meat, as in eating it, producing it, um, supporting the production of it. 
and uh, and those who don't, for whatever reason, whether it's environmental, ethical, or um, nutritional, they don't like meat. Um, and I, <clears throat> I, I I try to sort of not get involved in those conversations because they're usually pretty terminal. As in, they don't go anywhere. No one, no, no, no one side says thank you for that. That's wonderful. I now agree with you. Um, so it's they're often more around ego based kind of things. I think, which is fine. It's just I, I try and avoid them. But my point being that um, chewing on that little arm in there before thinking about its origin, um, thinking about how much water was produced. It might have taken to produce it. And look, an almond is not dissimilar to many other stone fruits. And and you know whether they be you know your your peaches or your apples or your well not not just stone fruits other fruits you know it does take um, water to produce these and you know some some places are, I believe in the world um, they are appropriate in that you know they pretty much do their own thing and they can survive and yes they might need some water like a lot of large you know cropping situation grapes um, orchards and so on um, horticulture situations need water um, but I guess it's what happens then you know what happens then. Um, you know how how much water is 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 needed by an almond tree to then produce a liter of almond milk? I don't know the answer to that, but it's it's interesting, I guess that, um, like especially for those who have decided not to have dairy for ethical reasons, so called ethical reasons, they don't like you know cows farting and burping and thinking that ruins a planet. So they'll, they'll the alternative is almond. But like, what are they? What is what what are the almond? Doing or not so much the almonds. What is the manufacturing, the production, the management of almonds doing to the environment as well? Or you know, replace almonds with soy or corn or anything else. So, but fascinating. Um, uh, oh no, I'll leave this. I'll leave that bit to the to part two. I think I've got another little interesting thing I want to talk about in regard to kind of two sides of a story. Um, so look, not too much, not too much um, roamering as Reese calls it. Um, this this one is two parts. Uh, let's get into Terry. He is fantastic. I had um, he was probably or his organisation was certainly one of the catalysts for my own regenerative journey some years ago um, through the, the programs that hit, that Terry started. And sitting with him in his first parts, really a lot about his his life. Um, we went pretty deep, uh, and you know, I guess his yeah. As the show um, aims to do, dig into his own regenerative journey, which is fascinating. A lot of stuff, you know. I thought I knew a fair bit about Terry, but there was a lot of stuff that um, I didn't clearly. Um, and you know, just the the mark of the man that that you know trials and tribulations and his his determination and and the way he sort of stuck to his values throughout his whole life um, in the in the pursuit of um, helping agriculture. You know, seeing the value in agriculture, seeing a better way to do it, or an alternative way to do it. So, here, without further ado, here is Terry McCosker, part one, sitting in the botanic gardens. Oh, just a little caveat too before we kick off. The I think every single buggy, and I might have said it in the interview, every single buggy I think that's ever been driven in the botanic gardens there in Brisbane was out that day and driving past us. I think, I'm not sure if it was on purpose, but there was a lot of activity. I didn't see too many blokes walking around, to be honest. There was a lot of uh, a lot of driving in buggies. <laughs> But I'm making the comment because it was actually quite noisy. That and the heli- helicopters, heli choppers, as Lordy calls them, um, made for interesting listening. But actually, when I listened to it played back, it actually was much cleaner than I thought. And I'm sure Reese is probably able to. Um, what do you do, Reese? You scuff it out. You do something clever to maybe even make it bring it a bit, bit clearer too. But I was actually pretty pretty happy with the um, after spending quite some time trying to find an appropriate site. Anyway, that's enough for me. The year is Terry McCosker, part one, part two. The following will be the following week. We'll get there in due course, but I hope you enjoy this interview, this long awaited interview with Terry McCosker. So what direction do you want to take? How do you want to? <laughs> We're on. We're on now. We're, We're recording on. live, Terry. Oh, no. You nearly gave it all away. <laughs> <laughs> we are, well. The trick, Terry, is I don't tell my guests. I don't tell my guests where we're going to take it. <laughs> and I usually ask my guests um, if anything's out of bounds. But I didn't. I didn't ask you that. Well, I don't you're not. You're not. You're not, you're not a sort of out of bounds kind of guy. Well, you're out of bounds kind of guy, but you're not like things are off the record. Mm. Um, Terry McCosker, 
if uh, our listeners haven't already worked out, um, is seated beside me. Uh, for those on the machine, on YouTube, you'll see him there. You, you get younger all the time every time I see you, Terry. You've got something kind of, you got some magic elixir thing going on. Yeah, I reckon it's life. Life. Do right. It's worth living. There's well, so much to do. Isn't there? There's no time to get old or down or stupid. There's, there's lots to do. It's so stupid. I like that. Life. And just quietly, um, we are in the, the... So welcome to the regenerative journey, Terry. And welcome to um, the the Brisbane City Botanic Gardens, a place I've been before. You've probably been here, yeah, a fair yeah, bit, a few times, yeah. a few times. There's actually a lot of people here. There's, there's, I, I don't know if actually Brisbane City Council could squeeze any more um, buggies into the into the into the park today. No, there's around about ten, I think, of them, or well, thirteen. I did a tour here recently, and I think there's somewhere around ten or thirteen. And I actually said that. Yeah, yeah, and I think there's about. 20-odd uh, gardeners. Well, I think they're all here. Well, they've got all the buggies out. I've seen probably, uh, I reckon, half a dozen different ones and mowers. That's something including the mowers. What you might not know, Charlie, mm. is that the gardens are run on regenerative lines. Really? Yeah. Yep. So oh, oh use, yeah, that, that, uh, that's they, why I picked it here. Yeah. Well, they don't <laughs> use artificial fertilisers. Uh, they they use compost. They're, they're right up with... Um, with some of the newer approaches to really? fertilisation. Uh, yeah, yeah, their gardeners are, are right onto it. Well, there was a fellow over here mulching tea tree there before and um, probably wondering why I had a little generator parked behind a big palm tree over there. I did, it's funny you say that because there was a chappy here with a, on a mower spraying the edges um, just in around here 15 minutes ago. I don't know what we is. Might have been geranium oil. Yeah, I don't know what with either, but that, it's likely not to be. Not, yeah. yeah well, I mean, certainly with it. people walking around, that yeah. would have been a bit rude. Yeah. Terry, um, let's get started. I mean, well, that, I mean, we are started, and 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 I think it's wonderful that um, we finally for those for listeners. I was just saying to Terry, we've stood we've stood each other up once each, so we're one all. Um, I started this podcast in May twenty twenty. So it's not quite two years old. And you've been at the top of my list for that shy of two years, Terry. And we finally, after I couldn't fly down to Burua there a few weeks ago and, and, and you had a diary clash the, just Monday, just gone, mm, yeah. we finally organised ourselves to be here in the, in the Botanic Gardens. And I have to say, it was a bit of a Russian tear this morning. I had to get a horse to a vet about half an hour west of here this morning. So for viewers who can see the, whatever that is on my front, that's from that. And um, we shuffled in here, parked illegally and dragged all our gear down here. And I'm glad I made the effort. I was a bit nervous about timing, but it actually worked. It was perfect. Mm. So, Terry, thank you for your time. I know you um, are a very busy man and, and thankfully all the stars aligned this time. And yeah, we're, that's good. We're here. I did, we did have a quick chat at the Albury um, uh, Land and Market um, uh, conference last year, which was I, that was, I was doing like 10 or 15 minute sessions with people um, uh, before and then you were the last. Actually, I stood you up that day. I remember that. Mm-hmm. I was going to meet you outside the conferencing. So now it's 2-1. Two, two, one. One. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, so the next time I try and catch up with you, I just know you're not going to turn up. Um, and we had a lovely half an hour chat. It was supposed to be 10 15 and I couldn't shut you up, which was wonderful because it was it was kind of a, such a lovely way to finish the conference and, and that became some little videos we put out there separately. Enough about me, me waffling on, Terry. Um, so glad that we finally could catch up. I have to I have to pump your tyres up just quickly um, up front. Uh, first time I saw you was at um, when I did Grazing for Profit in about 2006, five. And there was a video of you talking about grazing. It was pretty old. I think you had a you had a dashing mustache on at the time. You might have been. It was it was a it was pretty old, real. It was actually about nutrition. Oh, was it nutrition? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Oh, was. gut, gut, gut flora. Yes, nutrition. That's the one. Yeah. So yeah, that's so what. Yeah, it was rolled out. That's, that's the first time I spied you. Yeah. you they don't, are they still using it? No, I don't know. I, I, I look too young. <laughs> It's like people on, on LinkedIn or Facebook when you go, that's not them, and yeah, they use their 10-year-old. Right. 
<laughs> which I still reminds, feel the same age, though, Charlie. <laughs> well, I'm not not a word of a lie. You, you look you look as young as as um, well. You look a bit older than then because that was probably 30 years ago. Um, Terry, you've sort of already preempted my question about sitting here in the Botanic Gardens. I mean, what does it mean for you to be sitting here under a uh, it's a Java almond tree, I believe, because the sign says so. Um, there's a sausage tree behind us. You know, there's there's activity. There's probably as fresh air as you can find in Brisbane right now. What, what does it mean to you to be sort of and forget forget you're here with me? Just the fact that you're in this space. What is it? Is that is that a good feeling? It is a good feeling. It's got a really good feel about it. And to me, the exciting thing is just seeing the number of people wandering around and being part of it. And just slowly walking, talking, stopping, reading signs. Um, unfortunately, there's a heap of people going through at about 50 miles an hour on scooters and so on. But other than that, um, there's people enjoying it. And, you know, if you live in an urban space, how do you get to enjoy a little bit of nature um, and just sit down and listen to the birds, look at the ponds and see the ducks? And, you know, I just walk past a beautiful big... Uh, frill neck lizard and um, and it's a I don't know how they've done it but the energy here feels good did you have something to do with that no I didn't um, well you're I mean I, th- I think I don't know if there's an indigenous kind of um, footprint here or not I, I don't I, I'm not exactly sure kind of um, being the being on the river here dare, dare I say there might have been because often people who dedicate areas like this to people kind of subconsciously or otherwise pick up on kind mm. of previous usage and community, I, I suspect. Um, Terry, I want it bloody choppers. I guess I should have expected that, shouldn't I, in the city. Terry, um, just I'm going to kind of jump to something that I know you're passionate about, um, biome, breathing your biome. Yeah. T- tell me about it. That's something. It's a question I would ask later, usually. But we're here, and we're we're breathing biome. What what is what does it what does that make you mean? It means just breathing in some of the biology that's occurring naturally. The biology created by the grass in front of us, the trees around us, the birds, the the insects, all of that sort of stuff. And we were, I guess, we evolved with that, and part of it. And I think the more we learn these days about microbiomes, it's just unbelievable. You know, you, you start, start right with a seed and the seed's got its own microbiome internally, mm-hmm. its own microbiome externally, and then that plant germinates and it creates another whole microbiome in the root system and then it creates another microbiome on the plant itself and then it creates another one on the on the fruit or whatever that plant bears and then we get to eat that so we're actually eating that microbiome and and then we get to breathe it as well when we when we're in a good space space and i think if you again i i couldn't consider living in a you know a concrete jungle like this because you'd just be breathing um diesel fumes and petrol fumes and concrete fumes and and listening to unnatural sounds, and and I think, to me, one of the one of the most really interesting things is bird sound first thing in the morning, and the role that bird sound plays in nature, uh, in our lives, uh, but particularly for plants. You know, plants wake up and respond to that bird sound. Fair dinkum. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so uh, I think it's there's also frequencies in mm. those bird sounds, which I think help set us up for the day. And if you're not exposed to that kind of stuff, I don't know how you set yourself up right for the day or the week or the month or the year. That's interesting because last night, um, just very quickly, I met with a group of um, other parents. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should have checked the um, the flight schedule this <laughs> before. <laughs> We've got, oh, is that a chopper or that mower? It's actually the mower. Mm. Maybe. You got both. No, we've got both, actually. Um, a group of parents. We might actually... Uh, I'm wondering whether we even just take the, 
Is that take those headphones off, Terry? Because it's really quite intense, isn't it? Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Yeah, that's better. Because yeah. that's going to be exhausting. I'm just going to have to. I, mm. I trust that it's all going to sound all right. Um, there's nothing we can do about the background noise. The interesting thing is, I met with some people last night, and um, wonderful group, um, spirit group. We call ourselves, and we're sort of looking at Steiner and anthrop- anthroposophical kind of principles, and a vet who's sort of doing our little our, our teaching. She um, talked about that sunrise and sunset is the pinnacle of of good. Uh, I'm, I'm using good and evil, not evil necessarily, but the kind of it is the time of. And this is not a reference to uh, uh, religion, church religion. This is kind of spiritual sort of context. Um, the Christ energy is highest at at midnight at um, at sunrise and sunset. It's okay. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. Mm. Um, why is that important, though, Terry? Uh, physiologically, like what happens when we breathe? Um, you know, the 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 oxygen that's come out of this Java almond. What is that actually, or the or the breath that's come out of the lungs of an eagle? What what is that doing in our in our in our bodies? I'm sort of referencing Zach Bush here too. Yeah, I I think it's actually adding to our our internal microbiome then because every part of our body has its own individual microbiome. So mm-hmm. your hand has got a different microbiome. So the front of your hand, for example, got a different microbiome to the back of your hand. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, your nose, your mouth, your lungs, your gut, different parts of your gut um, have all got different microbiomes. Mm-hmm. And so we're run by that biology. We think that we're running the place, but we're actually being run. And right through to our moods, you know, mm. are determined by that biology. So I think, you know, just getting access to the natural biology. Um, you know, I think any form of nature, whether it's the sounds, whether it's the smell, whether it's the just the feel of it, um, you know, the breathing in those biomes. That, because this air around is just full of stuff. Isn't it? It's full of stuff. Yeah. And um, we're just taking that in. Uh, and, you know, some of it, well, I think we're probably going to reject, our body will reject, and mm. some of it will handle and mm. take on board. Terry, I was just thinking, was this, this, this Java, uh, Java almond, I guess it's from Java, one would, one would suspect. I mean, the fact that we're um, sitting under it, we're being exposed to a biome that, that, can't, that, that we may not normally be exposed to. I mean, I'm thinking like kind of continent where our bodies are, you know, I guess you're, you've have you got we'll get to it, Makoska. You that's where's that? What um, origins? What what part of you um, UK? Well, it's Irish. Um, okay. Well, I'm not sure whether it's Irish or Scottish. There is a theory that we started in Scotland in yeah. the 1600s, and we're part of the problem in Northern Ireland. <laughs> with, you know, the Protestants that went across and settled Northern Ireland. Uh. Um, but when I got to Ireland and tracked down my relatives, they're all Catholic and they're all on the other side of the line. So yeah, right. You know, I. Um, but then, when you start digging into Irish history, there's it's pretty mixed up. It's pretty grey. There's plenty of Spanish in there. There's plenty of Scottish in there. There's a bit of English in there. Um, but at the end of the day, it's Irish. Uh, and so, uh, so there, my roots at the moment, and I can trace my my maternal grandmother straight back. She emigrated from Ireland uh, at the age of eleven. Mm. Yeah. And uh, my great grandfather. Um, arrived in Brisbane in, in 1846 from Ireland, and he was a he was a builder, a carpenter, and we come from a long line of of uh, what I've heard is uh, is poachers and smugglers because the uh, ca- the family uh, lives right on the border, right on the river, and uh, so they That's a classic. you know yeah. poachers and <laughs> they smugglers could take stuff from Southern Ireland across into Northern Ireland, take stuff from Northern Ireland back into Southern Ireland, and in the meantime they. They'd poach a few fish out of the river and so on. <laughs> but, but they actually were a long line also of painters and decorators. Really? And yeah. So I asked them how they got through the, the famine. And they said, well, because back in the famine era, uh, painters and decorators were actually a, a highly recognised art form because as a painter or a decorator, you actually mixed your own paints, you made your own mm. paints, you created your own wallpaper and all of those sort of things. So they were a, a pretty highly qualified um, trade. Still. And so they said what happened during the famine there was because they were working on big houses for, for, for wealthy families, the wealthy families fed them. 
So they survived. Yeah, they got through okay. Yeah. But my, That's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Do you think they, they poached the stuff they poached and smuggled they might have then used in the in the decoration? They they did they poach did they smuggle th- wallpaper? No, I don't think so. I think that the, combining the two yeah, skills. I think what they poached and smuggled was more about food yeah. and feeding, you know, feeding them themselves. Yeah. You know, feeding their families and feeding other families. Yeah, right. Well, you've done it. That's a lovely segue. Um, we've gone back further than I was going to, but I'm, I'm, that's fantastic. I guess my point back to the Javanese, you as an Irish person, your biology over eons, uh, you know, smelling the um, you know, uh, bi- biome, biology of a plant that's very foreign, I guess that's that in itself is an interesting concept, you know, how the body actually responds to that and the memory of that. I mean, there's actually something in... Um, uh, what's that stuff in um, genetics? No, well, I'm, I'm thinking more the the uh, is it hemp um, that we have receptors in our bodies for is it THC or, or one of those CBD or one of those one of those a- active ingredients in 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 hemp that our bodies actually have in them receptors for that very that very chemical mm-hmm. that you know wouldn't receive anything until that enters the body. So isn't it fascinating that yeah. you know even you you do. I'm sure they weren't growing hemp in Ireland back then, but no. somehow your body has that in it. Mm. Um, Terry, this um, uh, <laughs> we're tangenting already. I might have to put a sign up, Marcy, these blokes just not to drive past. Mm. <laughs> They're just doing laps. Um, Terry, this is about your regenerative journey, and I want to, we've already gone back to the 1800s, which is fantastic. Now there's a bloody tractor. Yeah. Sorry, listeners, or do we mind as let him go? Sponsored by Kubota. <laughs> it's all Kubota gear. Uh, hopefully they're knocking off soon, uh, <laughs> if they started early. Terry, um, this is about your regenerative journey. How, and how, how far back do you want to go? Where? Let's go back to birth of Terry McCosker. Where did that take place? Into what sort of situation... What were the early early years yeah, of Terry like? I was born in a little town called Wandai, um, which is in the South Burnett region of Queensland. Um, raised for the first 13 years of my life on a very small uh, dairy farm. We milked about 30 cows, as did everyone else in the district. Um, we um, separated that out and uh, the pigs got the, uh, the skim milk and the cream went off to the butter factory. And then the butter, the butter factory produced the butter. The butter then went by train. Uh, somehow or other, it ended up in Brisbane. And then uh, that jumped on ships and they went across to Britain. And then in the, uh, in the 60s, um, Britain joined what was then called the common market, which now people know as the EU. And so they stopped buying product like butter from the colonies and started buying it from the common market. And... Uh, that just killed the dairy industry in Queensland overnight. Um, so the dairy industry, when I grew up, there was 55,000 dairy farms in Queensland at the time. That was in the late 50s and into the 60s. Um, and that survived through probably uh, to the late 60s. Uh, and then once that butter uh, market went, um, all our small dairies just shut down. All the butter factories shut down, dairy shut down. We were on a... On a farm where we grew pigs, we grew maize, peanuts. Um, and what happened was we are actually one of the first farms in Queensland where the issue of tree clearing on slopes created salt in the valleys. And our, we had one water source, or two actually, a dam, which you know didn't always feel it was only a little puddle in, when I look at it today. And we had a well that was only about six or eight feet deep. And that well went salty. And we didn't know it for a number of years. It, the salt gradually built and gradually built because as the trees were cleared, and it was Brigalow country, we were clearing the trees off the, off the tops of the ridges. Um, that changed the water cycle, it changed the water table in the valleys. And the water table started rising up close to the surface and would go down and close. Every time it came up, it would leave salt behind and go back down, come up and leave salt behind. Anyway, what happened was the dairy cows weren't milking all that well and um, their hides just went, I can still remember it, their hides were just hard and leathery and um, 
Dad got the local vet out and eventually uh, he diagnosed it as salt toxicity and it was the water. And anyway, so we couldn't use that water anymore. So then I remember Dad with this little Fergie T20 and a little thousand gallon pot on the back of it on a trailer and he would drive in every day into the butter factory and come back with a thousand gallons of water to water the animals um, and we lived off uh, water tanks and so mm. you know our uh, we grew up in what I what today you'd class as absolute poverty um, we had we basically had nothing we ate uh, you know if, if we had calves we would kill a calf and eat eat the veal um, Occasionally, we'd kill a pig. Uh, we'd grow around pumpkins and things like that. And um, but we had, had no money, and um, so and we also had no water. So we had no running water in the house. And uh, I can still remember that we would all have a like a bath once a week, all in the same water, mm. about two or three inches deep in the bottom of the bath. The whole family, and there were seven of us. And that was that was our hygiene. We only, only, and that was all the water we had. So it was just, and it wasn't just us. It was the whole district lived like that. It was just normal. And, uh, and it was that was that through particularly dry times, or that was kind of normal, normal. It normal. was basically normal because yeah. the house had no running water. We had no running, we had no hot water in the house. So we had a, a wood stove, and uh, the only hot water we had was a little thing on the side of the stove. And so if the stove wasn't going, we had no hot water, and. Um, but that, we didn't know that that wasn't, you know, what you do. Uh, sort of, you look back on it now and you think, oh, that's a bit abnormal, uh, you know, having a bath once a week. Um, and, we, and we must have stunk. I tell you what, going to school. Talk about biome. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, I reckon it's one of the reasons I'm so healthy, healthy today. Yeah. Because I can still recall as a kid, um, I must have been eight or nine, and in the morning, we had, the pigs were a bit sick, and in the morning before going to school, um, I'd go down with Dad, and he'd catch the pigs, and I'd inject them with penicillin. And then we had these bloody big needles, the old glass-type ones, mm-hmm. you know, and so my job was to inject them. And so, and then I'd go straight from there to school, straight from the pig pen to school. And, um, but it was, I didn't smell it because we, we were used to it. But the poor teachers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and yet there was kids on our road that we thought were poor compared to us, yeah, well. you know, that were much worse off than us. Mm. And they only had pumpkins to eat, you know. Well, we, we had a bit more than pumpkins to eat. but And then often we would finish a meal and still be hungry because there wasn't enough food on the table. Um, and again, I can remember Dad, who was a, it was a Second World War vet. So, you know, he left the war in forty six, and we're now talking in the 50s. So it wasn't very long. And, um, and most of his mates were returned servicemen in town uh, Anzac Day was a big day for him and um, but I can remember him would still give us the last food off his plate you know he'd been out working all day we might have been at school we were still hungry at the end of a meal and he'd mm. give us his lamb chop or something you know and um, so I, I reckon I picked up my humanity from dad and to come out of that war, and, and he fought for four years, and he was a very, very human person, um, a, a very loving and giving person. And, um, you know, he he set up lots of things in the district. He established the local show um, and built the showgrounds. Um, did all, you know, was on the school committee, was on, all that sort of stuff, you know, um, which back in those days, it was a community and there was, you know, local dances and everyone got together and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So that was, I guess, my upbringing there. But I really, I guess, mum loved that land and, and they bought that property off her father. I was going to say, so she was from, she was from there? She was from there, yeah. yeah. Right. And she absolutely loved the land. And, um, and I got the love of the land from her and horses. You know, we grew up on horseback, I can... My first buster was at three, and I can still remember it uh, <laughs> clear as day. Like, I still saw. Yeah, but I mean, I climbed up on a horse that I shouldn't have been on, like, and I can remember this too. The horse was tied up in the yards, and I climbed up the rails on the fence and then jumped across onto the saddle. 
and the horse must have got a fright Open and just gate. spun around and I just hit the ground. <laughs> <laughs> they played more on, busters yeah. after that too, but that was the first that was one the first. I really remember. That's three. Good on yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so then that place, we actually had to sell it in 63 and we moved to another dairy farm down closer to Brisbane, which was then a whole milk farm. So what made just a question on that? I'm just interested. The, the was it was it butter was the thing when you're at Wandai because of transport, like you just couldn't get the milk from there to to where it could be drunk. So butter was an easy way to yes, transport it. It was butter, yeah, because there was no refrigeration back no. then. Um, when we moved down close to Brisbane, uh, well, we still didn't have electricity, so we had no electricity either. Um, so that was the fifties, early sixties. We left there in sixty three. We moved down to near Caboolture, which is an hour out of Brisbane. Mm. Um, in 63, still no electricity. We got electricity there in 65. Um, so the first 15 years of my life, we, we'd never experienced electricity. We'd never experienced running water. Um, I didn't experience a flushing toilet until I left home and went to study and went lived to Brisbane, in Brisbane. You know, there's, that was sort of, uh, it was a basic upbringing, but it was, it was brilliant. I, I just loved it, my, my childhood. I love it, you know, and I and it's responsible for the microbiome that I have today and the constitution that I have today. Mm. Um, you know, living and working in horse shit, cow shit, pig shit, um, and working with the soil. Uh, like when we worked as kids from the time I can, I learned to drive the tractor at eight and I was pulling stumps out with dad. I don't, he would put the chain on the stump and I was on the tractor when I was eight. And, um, and I can I can still remember the first stump we tried to pull out. It was too big for the tractor, and the tractor reared up, and I had no idea what to do. Oh, you're in the seat. I was in the seat, oh. and the tractor was at about forty five degrees. And Dad raced around and jammed his hand on the clutch, and the mm. tractor fell back down to the mm. ground. Then he just said, "That's what that's all you need to do." <laughs> remember that next time. Yeah, remember that next time. You just need to put your foot on the clutch. Of a That's it. Rare. Yeah, so no, like, get out, you can't do that. No, no, That's no. dangerous. And then it was continue long. Well, he needed help. Yeah, you know? totally. And, um, yeah. you know, I remember at 11, I milked the entire herd. Did, I mean, Mum and Dad were away one night for some reason or other, and I got home from school, and I decided I'd just get all the milking done by the time they got home. And, and that's you know, by hand? Well, no, we, yeah, we had you machines. Had, you had machines, yeah. yeah. But uh, the only thing I couldn't do was screw the separator down to the right tension in the separator. So yeah. the milk was still sitting in the vat when they got home. So. Yeah, but I mean, you, you didn't have to do that. Uh, no, but it was helping them out. You know? Totally. Um, otherwise, they'd have had to start milking in the dark. And as I say, we had no electricity and would have been lanterns. Um, so, you know, but, uh, but it, was a, it was a great life. I loved it. Just <clears throat> something that come, often comes up, Terry, is, um, you know, as a reference point, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, my grandfather went to, he signed up for the First World War when he was 15 and he turned 16 on the boat over there with his horse and his saddle and his bridle and, uh, you know, whatever else he had with him. And I wouldn't have known my head from my ass when I was 15. Like, to do that... Is 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 amazing. I, 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 I've no doubt you could have done it, um, given what we've just learnt. <clears throat> but I guess what I'm challenged by is, um, and this is not trying to sound like an old fuddy duddy, but challenged by the whether you call it attitude, the character, the integrity, the the kind of the 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 wherewithal of um, you know our our current and our future generations and. I'm kind of alerted to that, you know. Mm. Do you share similar concerns or maybe not concerns but kind of thinking around, you know, I don't expect people to go and live without electricity but, you know, some of the things I see in here, I think, gee whiz, you know, if they're, if they're under any sort of duress, if they, didn't, if they walked into a house and there was no electricity, it would be the end of the world. Yeah, yeah, and... I have real concerns because, you know, in Australia today, just, just take diesel, we're three weeks away. If something happens seriously, we're three weeks away from being out of diesel. That means we have no trucks. Mm. We have no food being delivered. Um, we would probably still have power if, if we're still allowed to use coal. And, but everything stops. Um, the farming will stop. The food mm. production will stop. The food distribution will stop. And um, we're three weeks away from that. Yeah. And so I think 
and it really concerns me because they're, um, you know, I think my kids grew up a lot softer than I grew up. But, um, you know, we were broke when they were growing up, so they grew up reasonably tough as well. They're, they're resilient. Um, but I'm really concerned about some of our grandkids, you know. Um, i got a 10-year-old grandson now, and his father still cuts his meat up. You know, when he sits down to a meal, and I, and I, <laughs> I'm, you don't like to interfere, but you think, my God. <clears throat> um, I was driving tractors, milking cows, blowing stumps out at that age, um, which is something I learned early on was how to blow stumps out of the ground. Um, what was, which was you're, you're in, in uh, no, you're uh, diesel? Sulf, uh, um, ammonium nitrate and diesel. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Detonators and yeah. fuse. And, <laughs> and Dad and I would get out there and we'd dig the holes under I the I bet you didn't get that little ticket at the TAFE course, Terry. I did. Oh, you did? Yeah, two right later on, when, yeah, I, came, when I started studying ag, <clears throat> this was still back in the when was I, 60s when I started studying ag, um, part of our course was how to blow our stumps. And so... As a, as a, as a practical farming as a practical farming activity. tool, because machinery wasn't great. You've got to remind, yeah. remind, machinery wasn't big in those days. No. We'd just come out of the Second World War. All these blokes are used to blowing things up. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I guess so. I guess you know, so. The loud noises were not foreign to them. No. And so, and we were just, it was just natural. We, that was the only way we could get them out of the ground. Mm. And so, um, and it was part of the course that I learned. So, here I was, you know, probably <laughs> six, seven years later, uh, officially learning how to blow stumps out of the ground. <laughs> uh, yeah, give me that. I'll show you how to play, do it. Yeah, yeah. So, what is that? What is that? I, I guess, how, what's the antidote for that? For that kind of, um, I don't know, oh, upbringing or huh? adversity yeah. is the antidote to it, and I suspect that we're headed for some of it. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, things things come in cycles. Mm. Everything cycles. Nature cycles. The carbon cycles. Um, politics cycle. Mm. Human cycle. Economy cycle, and. There's a perception today that that we're on this gravy train that can just continue, yeah. and you can't. Um, you know, the in terms of humans at the moment, we're somewhere between fifty and sixty percent overstocked with the carrying capacity of Earth, and so um, something something's going to happen in the next few years. Somewhere it could happen tomorrow. It could happen in two years, five years. I don't know when, but. Um, the gravy train we're on right now is going to come crashing down. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, I talk with my kids about this and uh, and we're all on the same page. We all know that this, that where we're at right now is not, it's not the future necessarily. So in other words, the past is not necessarily the future. And when you step right back and look at the larger political cycles globally, where you have empires that build and then empires that collapse, and empires that build and empires that collapse. And so the US empire was the last empire to build, and you can see now that that US empire is collapsing and crumbling. Mm. And as the power of the US collapses and crumbles, and now you can see that the next empire is potentially built by, by China and or alliances with the, um, the dictators. Um, and so the world order, as we expected, of being orderly and nice, um, it's, that actually hasn't been normal for the last, you know, eight, ten thousand years of what we call civilization. Um, the, these things come in cycles, and so we we are likely to head back into a cycle now where things get progressively worse uh, globally, and that will impact Australia. It'll impact us individually. Um, and therefore, resilience, our personal resilience, is something that I don't know how we get back into that back into, you know, the population generally. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, you, you well, you take take the floods, take the, the stuff that's happening right now. Um, when adversity hits, resilience reappears, community reappears, people start working together, start thinking together. Uh, and and I think that's as big issues hit us, we will head back to the things that work, which is community and working together and helping one another. 
you know, and resilience. Looking for more information to assist your regenerative journey? Come join Charlie and his guests around the kitchen table, an online community of supporters with exclusive access to the regenerative journey interview transcripts, live online Q&A sessions, a chance to engage with other like-minded people and more. Go to www.charliearnett.com.au forward slash the kitchen table and we look forward to sharing a yarn with you. Now let's get back to this week's episode. You know, that old phrase, there's no growth stimulant like pain, mm. you know, and, and that we all might have to in varying degrees and situations experience that pain, that adversity. Um, now I guess, you know, what people do at that time is, you know, will be based on their previous experience of adversity and how they learnt and could cope and then I guess there's a, potentially a lot of people who just will not know the first thing to do. Not a, like, you yeah. know, whether it's an immediate adversity like there's no fuel or no food or a long-term political one or, or whatever. It is... It is um, so my, my family and I are personally preparing <coughs> for food shortages. Yeah. Are you, yeah, for like... For, um, and the in, reason, I guess the reason is that my parents came through the Great Depression and my parents instilled in us never be without a piece of land that you can grow food on. Mm. So that if you if we ever go back through another Great Depression, you can at least grow your own food and eat. And it was it's the people who can't produce their own food or, or eat who are going to be in the most trouble. And so we're deliberately doing things and have been for some time, uh, be trying to get more and more self-sufficient um, in food or or being able to get by with you know, whatever. What about power? Um, yep. Power too? Power, <laughs> power's an issue. And when, when I analysed that, the power issue actually came back to fuel. And so um, because how do we, if we've got to go to work or we've got to go to town or we've got to do something, how do we actually get there without fuel? Um, and so I've got a couple of camels. I'll hook them up to a, um, a dry, a, tra- a dry yeah. trailer, um, or we can walk to town or ride a bike to town. So that bit doesn't worry me. Um, but if the grid goes off, I've got a, a gen set. But that's fine. Um, but when, where do I get the fuel from fuel. For the gen set? <clears throat> and how do I get to, to a bowser to get that fuel for the gen set? So we're thinking through those issues at the moment. And... Um, um, it's not an easy one to get around. No. Uh, so I haven't overcome that yet. No, but I guess, I guess the good news is there, there are options, and it's all about preparation, isn't it? It is. Yeah. You know, preemptive kind of kind of yeah. stuff. Well, I'm glad we went, well, we went there. I, I didn't even think that that was going to come up, but it was um, kind of obvious point there. Um, Terry, I want to so thirteen. You you went from Wondai to Kabulcha. Was it thirteen? Mm, yeah. Um, Milk, dairy, there. Yeah. Um, what happened then? Well, my ambition was to become a dairy farmer. Um, so I've, I've got a couple of claims to fame. First, first one was that I failed primary school. How do you how do you fail primary school? No, I couldn't pass grade six or seven. I well, I actually tested. There were tests, were there? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, really? you had to get tested. Back in those days, you got scores. Yeah, right. A, B, C, or D. Yep. D was a fail. Yeah, right. And it didn't matter. It you was were, okay. You, you, were high, you, people you were good at Ds, were you? I was good at Ds. And so I, I uh, was a failure. And um, so eventually I had to repeat. I think it was grade seven I repeated. And then um, so I had to repeat that a year in primary school and then uh, got into high school. And, um, and I couldn't complete high school either. I was too dumb to complete high school. <laughs> and so um, <laughs> I was... And, and, and by also, their standards. By their standards. And I guess what I realised today is that I wasn't actually stupid um, or didn't have the ability to no. learn. It was the way in which we were taught things and that was the 
the educational process that didn't agree with, or I didn't agree with. Mm. I suppose I rebelled against the educational process and the way um, things were pumped or the rote learning and all that sort of stuff and uh, just didn't suit my way of learning. Anyway, I got to high school and discovered ag science and in grade nine, I think, we, I had a, a high school teacher there uh, who I'll talk a little bit about because he's, he's had a massive influence on my life. And he, I started doing a couple of ag subjects, animal husbandry and agriculture. And the first exam we did, I got A's. And I thought, you nerd. Yeah, like, what the <laughs> heck? I've never got an A in my life. I fail things, yeah, and um, these A's, and and uh, and it continued, and and I just loved it. I just lapped mm. it up, and uh, so I knew that's where my future was. But my my goal was to become a dairy farmer. I just wanted to go home and milk the cows. You were already a dairy farmer, I guess, weren't you? It was a continue course, that yeah. that 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 whole thing. Yeah. Um, and fortunately, Dad said to me because I, I had the chat with him one night. I remember, we were walking back from the dairy, and. Uh, you know, all the wisdom summoned up by about a 13-year-old and I said to him, you know, Dad, I might have been 14 even. I said, you know, I'd like to come back and run the farm. And he said, no. He said, none of you are coming back to this place. You're all going to go away to get a profession or a trade or something else, but none of you are coming back to the farm. That just shattered my dreams, you mm-hmm. know. Anyway, um, but I want to talk a little bit about high school te- How a teacher mm-hmm. can change a life. And we spoke John Fletcher, who's still alive today. And um, I had, I've had a f- three amazing privileges in the last 10 years. And this John changed my life and he ensured that I actually passed some of my high school subjects. And then in, I don't know what year it was, about probably about 2014, 12, 13, something about there. The high school decided to award me, uh, put me on their wall of fame, they call it. There was only about six people on the wall of fame. And I got inducted that one night with Keith Urban. Keith Urban and I were inducted at the same time. We both come from Caboolture High. Really? Yeah. So we were both inducted the same night into the Caboolture Wall of Fame. Anyway, so that... And, 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 hang on, and when did this happen? When was this induction? Two thousand and fourteen or something like that. And uh, anyway, I yeah, right. I was going to take Fletch down to that because he taught me in that high school. And me he just he rang me up the day before. He said my back's so bad I just can't come. I said, oh, Fletch, righto. About two years later, Central Queensland University conferred on me an honorary doctor of agribusiness. I was able to take John to mm. that. And that was 50 years after he first influenced me. And I was able to take that teacher to that ceremony. And then the first person I rang when I got an OAM was John Fletcher. Oh. Yeah. What age would he have been when you were at school? Well, he can't have been much older than us, actually. He would have been in his early 20s. Yeah. And he knew mum and dad really well. He's, and he still remembers the whole family. He asked me all about all my siblings. Wow. How are they all going by name? Um, and he still talks about, you know, getting on the grog with dad. And so, you know, um, yeah. And what, what was it about him? Like, because you've jumped to the future or the, the closer to the present with the, the sort of the, how you've kind of, um, Acknowledge that with him, but what what happened at school that you that really you know got you? I think it was he actually gave us our head and allowed us to learn in the ways that we could learn, which was different from what I think ways I'd been taught. And so he was, you know, where he needed to be, he was one of the boys. When he needed to be, he could discipline us, but he didn't do that very often. But he just had fun with us, and we had fun learning, mm. you know. And um, and he was enjoying it, and we were enjoying it. And I think that was probably the major difference. But he 
he was passionate about what he was doing. He wanted us to learn. And, and he, I guess he felt that, you know, we had a bit of potential as well and we were going to lose it if we didn't. We being a couple of your other classmates. Yeah, mate, other mates, yeah. In the class, yeah. There was only 11 of us in doing ag. Yeah. We were a very tight-knit group. So he was very influential. What? Um, so you finished up school there? Yeah. And then where did you take your, your ag interest? I went directly interest? from there into Queensland DPI. So I went yeah. straight from high school into Queensland DPI as a cadet. You can't. It was only a very small window where that was even possible. Um, without any qualifications, without even finishing grade 12. And I went straight into into a job in Queensland DPI. And because I was actually off a farm, off a dairy farm, um, and was a pretty practical sort of bloke, um, I, by the time I was... Well, I think I joined DPI when I was 17. Well, by the time I was 18, I published my first paper, and which had never been done before. And I also was was uh, let loose as an extension officer around Brisbane. So there was lots of people with 25 acres and 30 acres or 50 acres that wanted to grow a pasture, run a few head of cattle and that sort of stuff. So the guys um, that my bosses at DPI, they just gave me a ute and said, listen, you go out and sort these blokes out. So from about 18, I was an extension officer, but I was also working in research. So I was, my proper position was actually a... Um, an assistant to the local agristologist. So I was I was his sort of gopher. And um, and we were doing a lot of work on soil fertility around um, uh, phosphorus nutrition mostly in dairy pastures and, and dairy pastures. So that's you know, I spent four years doing that in Brisbane and studied at the same time. And then uh, Brisbane was a real novelty for a while. Uh, first flushing toilet, first running water. <laughs> Oh, wow. You know, all that sort of stuff. Um, but that novelty wore off. And then after about four years, I said to the guys in DPI, I, I want to get out of Brisbane. They said, where do you want to go? I said, I want to go to North Queensland. They said, right, I can go to North Queensland. So uh, I got transferred in the end of 71 up to um, uh, South Johnson Research Station uh, near Innisfail, North Queensland, the wet tropics. So I went from the dairy industry then to the beef industry. Um, and I was working in the dairy industry right around southeast Queensland um, as a cadet at that stage, and then went into the beef industry, still on pastures, still on soils. Uh, and then um, I felt after about, I was there, it was about seven years, I think I was there. And for the last probably three or four of those, I was thinking, I'm not making a contribution to agriculture here in what I'm doing. And so what I ended up doing was putting all my efforts into the community. I was on about seven or eight different local community groups. Um, I was in JC's, Toastmasters. Pam and I set up Meals and Wheels in Innisfail. We were in the local theatre. On and on and on. Did went, I? You, know, you were thes- for thespian, Terry. Yeah, yeah. Then I stood for council. And, you know, I couldn't string two words oh, together gee. and I spent seven years in Toastmasters. And I never missed a meeting in seven years. That's once a fortnight. And that was a lo- that was a local chapter, like that, local how they chapter, worked. Yeah, yeah right. And it was absolutely brilliant, and uh, one of the best organisations I've ever been in. Yeah. Um. Better make a note of that. Toastmasters. I've heard a lot about it. I've never been to one, but you reckon yeah. that, that that was, and that's all about public speaking, public your, speaking. your your confidence, and you know. Yeah. Well, I can remember one Pretty guy came in, now, there, came in there because he um, he was going to get married in about a year's time and knew he had to give a speech. <laughs> he was a plumber. Prepping. <laughs> and he was prepping. And the first time he stood up in front of the group, yeah. his mouth opened and he absolutely froze. Yeah. And then he sat down. And he came back two weeks later and he stood up, opened his mouth, absolutely froze, went and sat down. I've got to give him... A for effort. He came back again. Mm-hmm. The third week, he got some words out. Yeah, well. By well, the end of that year, he was able to deliver his speech at his wedding. You know, that's life changing. Well, I mean, that's and, pretty. Um, that's pre- preemptive stuff. Imagine if he'd gone three weeks out. Oh, I better just practice that yeah, speech. He'd yeah. been buggered. Yeah. No, no. He he was a gutsy bloke. So community um, activities. Um, you mentioned that you were kind of didn't feel like you were contributing. I'm sure you were contributing 
to individual farmers in a big way and, you know, the support you were giving them, but there was what there was a sense of that you had more to offer? In North Queensland, I wasn't. I was stuck on the research station and I wasn't connected to the industry and I think that was probably where my really underlying issues were because I'd been totally connected when I was in Brisbane and on the farm and then I lost that connection when I went on to the research station and that made me really uneasy and I just... How do I know that what we're doing is real or relevant or has got any economic value for people? And that really concerned me. And so um, the uh, the boss I was working for at the time picked up a consulting job in the Territory uh, for an American group. And then he and I probably weren't hitting it off all that well. And so he recommended me to take a job in the Northern Territory. And so... <laughs> That was for. Yeah, he right. said, well, he said, how it works." He said, he said do "You want to go over and you want to go over and interview, interview for this job." And I thought, "Yeah, I will." And he went, "No." He went, "No, you want to go and interview <laughs> for that job." Yeah. <laughs> it was a good way of getting rid of me, yeah. anyway. Because um, I'd gone flying. Actually, I'd got got my commercial pilot's license, and I was going to, I was going to fly commercially, and that's really? how I was going to get out of the DPI. Yeah, I was. Um, my next step was to get an ag rating because I was going to stay in agriculture and I was going to become an ag pilot and I was going to buy out the local ag pilot's uh, business and his aircraft. And uh, thankfully I didn't, you know, otherwise I'd have probably been crippled by chemicals or praying into a hill somewhere. So you're that ago. being an ag pilot, you're essentially, um, you're not carting passengers, you're carting, carting chemicals. chemicals. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. what it was about. And yeah. at that stage, I, you know, chemical, this is like we're talking 70s now and... Mm. Use of chemicals and fertilizers, that was just that was it, like the gung ho approach to everything. So there was a, was there a fair bit of that going on? Like like oh, that's what it was all about. The yeah. total focus of uh, all our branches in DPI that were involved in, you know, the broad scale agriculture uh, and the dairy industry. There was two CSIRO divisions all aimed at introduced pastures, fertilizers, intensification, um, all using continuous grazing. Yep. And, um, you know, which I didn't sort of understand that nuance at the time. Uh, but no, there was a massive focus on the pastures back in the 60s and 70s. So was there glyphosate getting around then or, or no, variations it wasn't on? around. There was <coughs> a bit of spray uh, seed. Uh, back then, we, yeah, we had, uh, we had dramoxone and uh, oh, we, yeah. we had some really good ones there. Yeah. Oh, that's the, that's the stuff that I, that just burns your nose out. Mm. We used to use a lot of that. Yeah. Filthy stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, it's dangerous stuff. Um, um, so, so that's kind of on the land. And then, what about sort of chemical use in cattle? Was there were there many you know back lines? Then what what was the kind uh, of the chemical treatments? No, not much in uh, dipping because the Brahmin was very common in northern Australia mm-hmm. at that stage, and so dipping had pretty well gone out the window. A little bit of dipping, not much, but buffalo fly was probably the biggest issue. So there was a bit of there was a bit of work on buffalo fly mm-hmm. trying to control them. But they just developed resistance to whatever you started using. Yeah, right. Quickly. Um, so no flying, well, flying, but not 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 your own business then. No, no. So I finished. I had a brand new commercial license, and then um, this job came up in the territory, and and um, so I said, yeah, I'll go over for an interview. So, and they flew Pam and I and my son Sean, our son Sean, over, and um, we landed in Darwin and went down to the station, and it was a three day interview. And uh, there was, I think, three Americans there and uh, and myself, basically, and we drove around paddocks for two or three days and sat down in the office for a while and had a yarn. And, and um, at the end of that three days, they said, well, you've got the job. And I said, well, I don't want it. <laughs> was, there, said, was, it a re- sorry, was it a research station? No, no, it was cattle station. No, no so it was like proper, yeah, yeah, yeah right, okay. Yeah. yeah. The job definition was that they wanted somebody who knew something about growing grass. That yeah. was the job description. Well, that was quite novel back then, I guess. Well, it was, yeah. And that was sort of my background. Um, yeah. So I I said, no, I don't want it. And they said, why not? And I said, look, I know nothing about this environment. Firstly, I've never worked in the extensive beef industry. I've never worked in the dry tropics. I don't know these trees. I don't know these grasses. I don't know these soils. I've never worked with an extensive breeder herd. I, you know, biggest herd I've ever worked is 30 head of cows. Like. And they had 12,000, mm. you know, and, um, and it was scary to me. So I said, no, no, I don't. I, you age what? what we're, we're just I to was get 27. It. 
It's true. Yeah. And um, so they said, they said, no. They said, no. We want somebody who has no preconceived ideas. And that clicked with me. And you would not believe how that paid off. Um, what I said to them, I said, just go to the local DPI. Pick up somebody that knows what they're doing. And they said, no, no, we want somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. And that was, that was incredibly brave when you think about that. How many businesses would hire a kid at the age of 27? Eventually they gave me the property and said, not give it away like in terms of ownership, Ancient. but said, fix it. And, and gave me unlimited resources to fix it. As a 27-year-old kid who knew nothing, if you imagine how brave that is. Well, I guess they, I mean, they would have seen character, wouldn't they? I mean, you, don't well, you they get higher on character and, you yeah, yeah. you know, not necessarily skills. And I suppose they appreciated that honesty. Hmm. Um, were they, was they was this a corporate mob or a family mob? Oh, or who? Corporate. Big Massive corporate, mob. corporate. They were, well, <laughs> it was actually a family corporate. It was a company called WR Grace. And uh, the head of the company at that time was... J. Peter Grace the Third, and the company was 125 years old. Is that America? When it's you American. said you've got the third, that that's an American kind of yeah. thing, isn't it? But the they were Irish, so right. J. Peter Grace the First had left Ireland as a 16 year old cabin boy on a ship, and ended up in the Atlantic, and then he ended up on ships that co- were collecting guano, shipping it back to the U.S. as phosphate fertilizer. Mm. He ended up owning the shipping line. Wow. Then in their second iteration, they owned Pan Am and they own the Florida rock deposits, which is still the major source of rock phosphate in the US today, Um, and then became an international global conglomerate. And Peter Grace used to fly out twice a year in his private jet and bring three secretaries with him, um, three or four pilots, and he would leave New York and fly straight to Darwin. They'd stop once for fuel. Yeah, man. And it was about a 24-hour trip. And he would, and then he would, we would jump in the ute and he would want to sit in the back and we'd just go bush. And he just wanted to drive around, see brumbies, see buffalo run yeah. around, see cattle. He just wanted the open skies, you know, and nobody around him that knew who he was. And, um, you know, one of his best mates was um, uh, Ronald Reagan, Fairly One good. of his other mates was Bob Hope. We'd wow. sit down under a tree and he'd start telling Bob Hope jokes. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty relaxed when he was there. Um, and then, he, so they bought this big chunk of country because it was cheap, but they were losing money hand over fist. And back in the 70s, when I joined them, they were losing a million bucks a year. And a million bucks a year in the 70s back was then, a lot of money. Gee whiz. And so that's why they wanted somebody to fix it. And, well, they had um, nothing to lose, did they? I mean, like, like they, they, they like, actually didn't have much to lose at that no. stage, and, and that might be why they made the decision they made. Well, like, well, we'll back a kid. Yeah, you know. Um, so anyway, I they said, well, so I started work with them, and then I drove around for six months, and I looked at all the problems, and I came back after six months, and I said to them, and I wrote a little report, sent it off to New York, and said, look. There's, your issues are too big. Just sell up and get out. Really? And um, and they said, well, we're not used to walking away from a problem. What do we need to do? But being 27 and full of crap, I just said, well, give me <laughs> give me a million bucks in three years and I'll sort it out for you then. And they said, well, you better do it. And I thought, oh, geez, <laughs> what, what have I just got myself into? <laughs> and they said, no, we're serious. Um, you design a research project. To overcome all our problems. Yeah. So I did. And I sent this research project off to them and designed all these experiments and all this stuff. And then, and my gut was saying, there's something wrong. I was just screaming at me, my intuition. Anyway, the manager at the state, that stage, who we, I worked very closely with, a fellow called Cliff Emerson, and he was a Texan and he had a master's degree in rangeland management. Anyway, I said to Cliff, there's something wrong here. He said, what is it? I said, I don't know, but there's something wrong. He said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, the only thing I can think to do is I'm going to go back to Queensland and I'm going to start in Mareeba and I'm going to drive to Brisbane and I want to talk to everybody I know 
between Mareeba and Brisbane. And I knew everyone because I knew all the CIRO people, all the DPI people, mm. all the experts. So he said, right, away you go. So I did that. And um, what happened, and that, it took me about three weeks to do that trip. And every time I explained my problems to people, the actual issues become clearer. Yeah. And it wasn't what anyone ever said. It was actually me explaining it over and over and It was over. in there. You just had to kind of... <clears throat> I had to get it out. Get it out. <clears throat> so my, obviously my subconscious knew what was wrong. Yeah, right. Because it was saying to me, you got a problem here. <clears throat> right? But I didn't know what was wrong. So uh, gradually, every time I explained it, I explained it slightly differently. And it came out. By the time I got to Brisbane, I knew what the problems were. Mm. So I flew back to, to Darwin and drove back to the station. And it was a Friday afternoon. I still remember this very clearly. And Cliff came up and he said, right, what would you find? And I said, I found we've got to go 180 degrees in the direction we've been going in. And everything I said in that research project is wrong. Really? And he just went, oh, shit. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so we sat down on my front lawn for the next two days, Saturday and Sunday, and argued. At the end of two days, I had him convinced I was right, that everything they'd been doing for the last, it was 12, 13 years, was wrong. And it was all based on existing research and existing science. Mm. And so... Um, so here was I going against all conventional wisdom. Um, so I sent off a report then by Telex to New York to say, I've changed my mind. Forget, <laughs> forget that. Yeah, forget that what I just sent you. Here's yeah. another one. We're going 180 degrees away from that. That was all wrong. Wow. Well, it was about five or six days later, three of these guys flew out from New York to – they were coming out to approve the budget for my first trial yeah. results, right? Anyway, meantime, I'd given them another one. I didn't give them a budget. I just gave them a different concept. So they drove down to the station in a high, couple of high cars and I had a little report ready on what, needed, what we needed to do. They just grabbed that, jumped in the cars, just grunted, went straight back to Darwin. And uh, we didn't hear from them for another four days. Eventually they came back and we found out after that they'd actually spent those four days on the phone trying to replace Cliff and I because we'd lost it. Yeah, right. They went, this is rubbish. This Your is buddy, rubbish. you've lost We've your We've got to get rid of these two blokes, right? Wow. But anyway, then they decided, well, we couldn't get rid of them that fast, so they're going to come down and have it out and get rid of us face to face. <clears throat> so they came down and we sat in the shed and we had a big whiteboard and I drew up a diagram and of where they'd been and where they needed to go. Mm. And we, same thing, just argued for nearly three days. I was shouting up, down, roundabout, and I just stuck to my guns. I just stayed with logic. And at the end of that period, they said, yeah, rightio, put together another research project to solve all of those problems you've just identified. And so I did. Um, and it took us five years and about a million and a half. And we solved every problem we set out to solve and a whole heap that we didn't know were there when we started. And that was massive scale research work done within the context of a system. And what I learned out of that was about systems. And so... I, because of the resources they gave me, they allowed me to have experts in any field from anywhere in the world. And so I would bring in, say, a soil expert, and he'd say, all you need to do with these blinkers on is fix mm. that, and 90% of your problems will be fixed. You bring in a, an ecologist, all you need to do is fix that, mm. 90% of your problems are fixed. Reproductive physiologist, mm. you just fix that. And nutritionist, you just fix that. And so... What I learned to do was pick bits out of all of that and build a system. And and so there were some of them only ever consulted for me once and they wouldn't do it again because I didn't accept their advice. Um, but 
by listening to their advice and realising it didn't fit. It was probably sound advice somewhere else, but it wasn't sound advice for what I needed to achieve. And they didn't know mm. the system that I was trying to put together. They're looking at it from a um, sort of a narrow perspective of a discipline. But when you're running a property or a business, it's holistic. It's, it's everything. It's business. It's people. You know, it's landscape. It's ecology. It's the weather. It's, uh, you know, it's everything. Um, and it's the production system and all of those things have got to come together. So well, what I learned to do was actually pull together stuff from everywhere and synthesise systems and work at a systems level, which I later learned is the same thing as holistic. Mm. Being holistic. Um, but I didn't know that word back then. So just, <clears throat> you mentioned it before, Terry, like there wasn't, there was your 180 degree to the turn to you was logical, but that was going against all of the science. Yes. So what was it that kind of, what was logical to you about it that no one had seen before? You know, like what, what was, yeah. like maybe what, maybe, maybe what was, what was the sum of the conventional thinking and the 180 degree thinking that you applied? You know, I'm imagining it's grazing, it's other ecological kind of indicators, like what, why was it logical to you and, and, and even all, all the science to that data yeah. was against it? I think one thing was, so firstly I came from the science background. So I'd read the literature. So I knew what they were trying to achieve and why they were trying to achieve it. But what I'd probably done that a lot of those scientists hadn't done is I spent six months on a motorbike riding around a couple of hundred thousand acres in detail, surveying it, looking for what was there. And and I wasn't finding what I thought was supposed to be there, but I was finding weeds, lots of them. I was finding bare ground. I was finding degraded systems, and I wasn't finding the improved pasture that had been put in. And they'd planted at that stage probably 70, uh, 70 80, 100,000 acres of improved Oof. pastures, um, and I found 6,000 acres of it. And so, and then <clears throat> the first year there, we ordered 12,000 tonnes of superphosphate that come up from Perth. And this is in the Territory. Yeah. Like that, like, I didn't even know they used... Road to... trains coming up constantly really? for months and then flew it all on. Yeah. And then I thought, okay, what are we doing here? We're trying to grow a legume or a plant in order to get protein into these cows and, in order, and we're putting the phosphorus on in order to grow the legume and get phosphorus into the cow. That's not working. Mm. Why don't we just feed the phosphorus and the protein to the cow? That was the first thing. The second one was the difference between the wet season and the dry season. There's an assumption, and there had been an assumption in all the research, is that the problems in the north are actually in the dry season. And all the research had focused on how do we keep animals alive in the dry? How do we get production out of them in the dry? My first wet season driving around and observing thousands of animals, I realised that the problems were actually in the wet. Yeah, right. And when I went back to the literature, I found it was there. The productivity was extremely low in the wet season. And then I thought, well, it is ridiculous to fight against the lack of protein and energy in the dry season when we've got a lack of protein and energy in the wet season, but it's easier to work with. Mm. Why don't we work with it when it's green and fix up the protein and energy issues um, <clears throat> and get our productivity then? Because we can only get our increased productivity in the wet and we weren't getting it. Yeah, That was probably the biggest breakthrough. So my focus switched from the dry season to the wet season and that was the breakthrough. And that was... But to do that, we had to change systems. So instead of thinking about pastures, um, I said, right, we've got to go directly to these cows. But we had, the first year I was there, cow mortality was 24%. True. The second year I was there, cow mortality, 23%. Right? Something wrong with the system when mm. that's, that's happening. <clears throat> um, branding rates, under well under 40, 50 well under fifty percent. That's a lot Close of that's a lot of cows. If there's twelve thousand cows there, yeah, yeah. So there was massive issues with animal production, yeah. which was staring me in the face. 
And so I said, right, the problem's in the wet. Let's feed them protein, energy and minerals in the wet. Well, not so much energy because the energy's in the grass, but protein and minerals in the wet. Mm. Fix that up in the wet and see what happens. So the protein wasn't there as a, as available because it was just so green and lush and green, carbohydrate. But and, the, yeah. the, the protein goes out of the grass and the tropics within 10 weeks of when it starts growing. And so it looks green you think everything's fine. Yeah. But your protein's gone. When your protein's gone, your energy intake's lower. So the whole system starts to slide, slide when you yeah. don't see it. Yep. And so I said, right, we'll correct that. But what we need to do in terms of pastures is we need to find grass-based pastures. So the system they developed was legumes in a native pasture with superphosphate, which was based on the success of superphosphate and, le- and clovers in southern Australia. And that's what they were trying to emulate. Yeah. But as soon as you increase the stocking rate onto that country, the animals ate the grass out. Yeah. And you ended up with legume dominance, which then put too much nitrogen in. Then the weeds came in and took over, and you ended up with weeds. So, uh, legu- so was, the, the, was it legume dominant because they, they weren't the, the legumes weren't as palatable, or they just went for the grass? They're not palatable in the first half of the wet, and the, and the animals would graze the grass out. Yeah. at the beginning of the wet season. Yeah, right. And then, then then there was no balance between protein and energy. Yeah. So the the system was clearly broken at lots of le- levels, um, but it hadn't been recognised anywhere else. And so, I convinced them of all of those things. And, and at the end of the day, they got it because it was pure logic, um, even though it went against the scientific sort of paradigms of the day. Well, you um, were ground truthing everything. I mean, I literally was, out yeah. there on, on, yeah. on your ute and motorbike or whatever, actually yeah. observing and going, that actually isn't working. And maybe, uh, I don't know, I guess the research can often, in isolation, can, can give you one thing, but when that research is applied to, to, nature, you know, landscape, yeah. it often just doesn't apply, does it? No. And it was because a, of all those other things. Yeah. You know, the but, system is like, yeah. oh, nah, this isn't working. It was a pretty big deal for me too because I jumped the fence. You know, I'd come from the research side mm. on into the real world. You're a trader. And suddenly <laughs> I, I had to come to the accept yeah. that everything I thought I knew was actually not right and never going to fit into a system. Was that um, – because that's kind of, I reckon that's a thing that a lot of people go through, like that, like whether it's, you know, it's a health-related thing or it's a business-related thing or, you know, farming. Was that tough to kind of reconcile and go everything I knew or I've, I've actually believed in or understood is wrong? Yeah, well, it took me right back to my childhood just that I'm useless, I don't know anything. Uh, uh, it really... Um, it took me right back to failing. You're a D man. You weren't an A man. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, right. And so here I just failed at this too. Um, but I grew confidence out of the success that we actually had by changing the paradigms. And I didn't know there were paradigms at the time either. I just we just did stuff differently. But um, you could have just bailed and gone. I've gone to a report. You know, I mean, you could have pushed on with that report, I guess. But or you could have just gone. Nah, it's all just too hard. Well, I, I was prepared to bail because I said to them, look, what you're trying to do is not working and it's mm. never going to work, so get out. And I was prepared to just walk away then and find another job somewhere. Did they ask you to 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 spin that on, on its head or was it Cliff that yeah, the, or you went, no, I, I'm actually determined to, to turn this around? Oh, they were the ones who said, well, you better fix it. Oh, right, okay. We're not used to walking away from a problem. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. at that stage, like this is the 70s, they were spending 50 million US a day, year on R&D in their own company. They had statisticians. Private yeah, private Jesus. companies. Sitting in New York, they had statisticians. They had all sorts of scientists back in their head office. And they were spending 50 million US a year in the 70s on R&D. So they, were, they knew that you made money out of R&D. And so they just said, right, we'll just turn it into an R&D project and mm. just sort it out. So that's a big turning point then. Um, I guess you were, you were ground truthing and proving to yourself and the world and to that business that there was there was more to it than, than, than the traditional paradigms that had been running that business for so long. Yeah. What what was the next step? Did people, did you get poached? Someone go, this bloke knows something. Well, the... No, I, at one stage, I nearly got poached by the Northern Territory government. Well, not so much poached. I was smuggled. No, no it actually—it well, was my initiation. Actually, I was 
for some reason or other, and this is a great story too, for some reason or other I was I was a bit pissed off with something at one stage. So and there was a Department of Primary Industries local uh, head advertisement in the paper. Oh yeah. So I thought, ah, I didn't okay. have a lot of time for the local DPI. So I wrote this about three page letter totally critical of what all the things that were wrong with the DPI. And and it wasn't really an application, it was just a bitch session. <laughs> three weeks later, I get this call. The girl in the office said, oh, the Chief Minister, Paul Everingham's on the phone, would like to talk to you. So you, you so you wrote this letter not as a you just went as it like just as a kind of as a, a response kind of like as a, as an you, you need to know oh what's an application yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you need to know these are all the things that need to be fixed <laughs> <laughs> and I'm your man yeah, yeah. oh classic yeah next minute the chief minister's on the phone mm. well, it took about three weeks and he rings up and he says look he said I see you've applied for the um, director of the department. Prime industry. So I said, yeah, yeah. He said, I really liked your application. <laughs> and I thought, well. Um, anyway, he said, well, I don't think you're qualified for the head position. He said, why didn't you apply for the 2IC? Mm. And I said, oh, I didn't see it advertised. He said, do you mind then if I sort of go to the public service and, and get your application dropped down to mm. the 2IC of the mm. department? I said, oh, yeah, go, go for it. So he did. So I went for an interview. Interviewed by the Chief Justice and I can't remember who else, but three people in the interview panel. And, um, you know, by this stage, I really wasn't too keen on moving there. So it was one of these, I don't really give a shit. Yeah, well, you yeah, go yeah, yeah. Don't really give a yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, So they did that. And they rang back a few weeks later and said, we'd like to give you a second interview. And by that time, I just chickened out. I said, no, no way, I, I'm not coming back. So I pulled out. But the fascinating thing was what happened next was... The guys arrived out from New York. Yeah. Because you were still working at the... Yeah, I'm still on the station. The station, yeah. And so they came down and they were on their way to Singapore um, after after us. And um, so they said to Pam, they said, I'll tell you what, we'll cash our first class tickets in and uh, we'll fly you across to Singapore and we'll put you up in the Shangri-La. And they did. They took. They flew her to Singapore, mm. um, put her up in the Shangri-La, took her around in a limousine, took her shopping, took her to all the shopping centres, mm. put her in centre touring Singapore for about four days, took her out to the best restaurants, mm. flew her back to Darwin in a private jet. Ah. Nothing was said. And then about three weeks later, I was sitting down with one of these guys who trained as a diplomat but he was a senior executive in WI Grace. And uh, the old Jim just said to me, he said, you know, we can offer a lot more advantages than, than the government. <laughs> 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 so they, must, they got wind of you having oh, yeah, made yeah, your yeah, little yeah, application I told them, there. I was up front. Yeah, classic. You know, and so, so they went, right, we'll keep this bloke. And yeah. did they? Oh, yeah, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah, How long? Yeah. Well, I stayed there till it was sold. Then yeah, they and then they gave me a huge bonus at the end. They gave me a few bonuses actually. I, my first bonus, at the end of my first year, was a world trip. Wow! So they sent me to the US. I'd never been out of Australia at that stage, and I thought I never would. And so my first flight, I fly Darwin, Brisbane, Sydney, Sydney, Hawaii, Hawaii into LA, and I had a. Arrived in LA, I think about six o'clock at night, and I wasn't flying out to New York until the next morning, about four or five o'clock. So I thought, right, I'm I'm off. So I I jumped in a cab and went straight to Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you knew about the states, yeah, Disneyland. Yeah. And it was like Anaheim. Yeah. Anaheim. Anaheim. Yeah. yeah, and I got back to my hotel at three. I had about one hour sleep and then got got back got back to the airport and flew six hours to New York, and then I was there. They sh- Chauffeured me around New York, took me to you know restaurants like the Four Seasons and things mm-hmm. like that, and and then flew me around the states. Then I went to Colombia, then down to Brazil, and back to South Africa, and then back to Perth and home. And I was away for six weeks. And um, when I got back, they said, "Right, what'd you learn?" And I said, "I learned I need to go back to South Africa." And so I went back to South Africa two years later and spent another six weeks back there, studying phosphorus nutrition. And mm. uh, protein nutrition. So, what year is that roughly? Like just to get a bit of a oh, chronological. Yeah, right, no, chronological. We're now talking. Um, 
would have been about 79, 80. Okay. Yeah, somewhere around that, about 80, yeah. I think I did probably did the trip to South Africa in 80 or 81, somewhere about there. Yeah. And what was so? What was the fascination there? What was the kind of the? What, why did you think that was going to get you into, or kind of what 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 riddles well, we were, were they doing, going to solve? I was doing a lot of work on on animal nutrition at yeah. that stage, around phosphorus nutrition and protein nutrition, and the South Africans led the world. Um, and so I wanted to get across where they were at and get across their technology and and learn from them. Um, and I did. It was it was wonderful. I visited research mostly research stations and scientists and. Mm. Um, and uh, Rumovite, which are one one of the largest feed companies in the world, yeah, it's still growing, um, and and have taken over lots of businesses in Australia. So they um, and they had really good scientists. Um, so I just learned a lot from them about how protein and phosphorus and energy and all that stuff worked, and um, and came back and and just continued to apply that knowledge back into the business and into the research I was doing around in nutrition. So wh- where d- where did um, RCS come into it? Like when did that kind of um, – was that late 80s? Like where was, Yeah, so – what was there, was there something in the middle there, though, from the station and territory? Yeah, so what happened was the station was sold in 85 and um, the Northern Territory Government then came to me and the Northern Territory Government and the Cattlemen's Association got together and said – we do not want this information lost because it was like That's it was good. groundbreaking information across yeah. about eight different disciplines, mm. and so they paid me for a year to sit down and write it up. And in that year, I published eighteen papers in eight different disciplines, each peer reviewed four times. Um, All based on your research, there, your experience, yeah. your results. Yeah, um, and wow. so that was. That was a fantastic learning experience as well, just to get to write all that up. It was probably, you know, two or three PhDs in what I wrote up in that year. Um, and and there was there was world-leading stuff. There was discoveries we made there that were the first in the world, like stuff we did, first ever. In the like world what? Um, one of them was uh, we I had a problem with bull fertility um, and I couldn't figure out what, what the what the issue was, but I knew there was a problem with the bulls. And um, so I set up an experiment to work out how uh, how to work out what bulls were worth keeping. But DNA didn't exist back then, and mm. so I found out that blood groups in cows are like fingerprints. Every animal has its own blood group. Wow. And if you're pretty smart, you can match blood groups of calves and dams and you can therefore match them back to a bull. So I was doing multiple sire mating in an open range situation trying to track what bulls were doing. So we would then muster those cows and calves, mother the cows up so we could match the calf to the dam Uh, and then using blood groups of calf, dam and bulls, we could match bulls back to calves. So we knew what bulls were getting how many calves. Yep. And And what sort of calves they were producing and well, as in, well, not you know, so much quality. What sort of car- no, 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 it was just how many. It was, this was just oh, about okay. survival and yeah, numbers. Yeah, um, and so I found straight away that I was using five percent bulls, and uh, three out of every five bulls in every group that I trialed uh, were getting me over ninety percent of the bull, the calves. Yeah, right. So I just two were just two percent of the done. bulls. Yeah. yeah, and and then I was trying to work out. How do you pick the three percent? <laughs> That's right. Uh, I only got sort of halfway down that track and never worked it out properly. That was one. The other one was the wet season protein deficiency mm. in Northern Australia. We mm. discovered that, proved it, operated and worked, and then proved how to fix it. Um, the, the other one, there was another one on ecology. I think uh, I'm probably the only person in the world that I'm aware of, anyway, that's related individual plant species positively and negatively to animal performance. So the so the, the 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 nutrition or the quality of the plant, the animal eating it, it's either going to be a positive or negative, correct resp- um, yeah. uh, outcome from that. And I did that in a thirteen thousand hectare experiment. We had sure. that was my big breeder experiment where I was doing nutrition research. I was also I also just monitored the plants, I'm not knowing what I was going to find. But every year we'd do a fairly detailed botanical survey. 
But how could you actually work out it to that to to that particular species? Like the yeah. you a good you're a good one or a bad one for these animals. So what happened? Well, I had variable animal production yeah. across these paddocks. Yeah, there was twelve or thirteen paddocks, um, and then we had variable species across these paddocks, like across thirteen thousand uh, hectares. That's a fair bit of variability across the country, and then with a lot of computer power and sort of some statistical approaches called an approach called pattern analysis, um, we were mm. able to find patterns in the data yeah. where particular plants were positive, and there was only four grasses that were positively correlated to animal performance, yeah. and there was about twenty odd that were negatively correlated to animal performance. So, Great. but then what? <laughs> then what we found <laughs> yeah. was that those four grasses were disappearing. Because uh, they were well, being selected. Yeah. Yeah, because the animals so, knew. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and this is where my journey in Regen Ag started. This was the first bit of gut feel that I had about Regen Ag, that there was a problem with what we were doing. And um, so I recognised that these desirable perennials were disappearing. And um, I... I bought, I bought ecologists out. We drive around the paddocks. I show them the data. I say, look, these grasses are declining. Um, and and I didn't have the data at that stage to say they were also the ones that were producing the animal production. But you could see they were in decline. Anyway, and the re- answer I'd get back from everybody that I asked was, that's just normal. That's just what happens. But my gut was saying, that's wrong, you know. Mm. Why would we... Why should Why we the most that? desirable species in your plant community disappear? And this was happening at a beast of 35 acres. Mm. Yeah, it wasn't right. heavily It stopped. wasn't, no. No, wow. Well, right. Yeah. So it was, it was being selected. Anyway, and that would have been happening across rangelands up there in oh, millions of millions Every of piece areas. of pasture in the world it's happening. Yeah, yeah. Not just rangelands in northern Australia. Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah, yeah. So animals select the ice cream plants. Yeah. Now, I, I had no idea at that stage what what was causing that. But again, I had this gut feel that, and I felt that I was doing wrong, you know, I was doing wrong by this country, this landscape, mm. um, to have that happen. But I had no idea. Nobody could tell me what was wrong. But that was about 85, 84, 85, 86, I had that sort of sense, and it just got worse. And then, um, and then I published all of that stuff in 85, 86, and then Cliff Emerson, the guy that who was my original boss there, he'd left the, the station halfway through the R&D program and he'd set up the Northern Territory Cattlemen's Association. Anyway, he'd, he'd gone back to the States in about 83 and he'd come across Parsons and Savory. And he came back to me with this pile of literature from Parsons and Savory and he said, have a read of this stuff. So I said, yeah, I'll take it and read it. So I read it and I saw him a few months later and he said, well, what do you think of that stuff? And I said, Cliff, I've never, never read so much bullshit in all my life. <laughs> I said, how in the heck could you afford to cut your country up into little paddocks and then muster them all the time? Yeah, right. right? It was just beyond my ability to conceive. And I... Bear in mind, at this stage, I'm sitting on a, an 850,000-acre property with very yeah. few fences. That would seem like, how right. could you have yeah. yeah. Right. So, Which is probably still uh, a paradigm. Absolutely. Up, I, know I understand that. Yeah, paradigm. yeah. Yeah, well, right. you were in it. Yeah. And, and also, I'd come from the conventional wisdom um, that just set stocking. That's, that's the way to do things. Yeah. So um, we... So, and so Cliff went back again in about, um, would have been 88, and he met Stan Parsons. Mm. And he came back again with stuff, and he, he talked to me about Stan. And he so said, Stan was based in the States then? Yeah, yeah, Stan was in Albuquerque with Alan. Alan was in Albuquerque as well. As well. But they weren't together at that stage. They split up in 83. Yeah, they were, just for the the listeners, they were, they started their partnership in, in South Africa? Or Africa they or actually where, where started Zimbabwe? it in Zimbabwe. Yes. Yeah. In, uh, in the, would have been late 60s, yeah. uh, early 70s, and then, then they moved to South Africa, uh, they worked in South Africa, Namibia, and then in the late 70s, they moved across to the US and thought, there's, there's the honeypot, we'll go there. Yes. Um, 
and they basically consulted. They weren't doing much teaching then. Um, and then they started doing some teaching. Um, and then in 83, they had a split. split. Um, and then Stan established the um, Ranching for Profit School yeah. and uh, Alan established Holistic Management. And they were both in the States with their separate streams at the same time? Yeah, both living in the same town, both living only a few hundred metres apart, the same part of Albuquerque. <laughs> wow. Um, anyway, I Cliff said he'd met Stan and he gave me this literature again and I read it and I came back to him with the same answer. I said, Cliff, this is just rubbish. Yeah, you know? can't do it. Can't do it. Anyway, Cliff was smarter than me and, he, and Stan and Hazel were coming out to Australia on on holidays in 89 and um, the and Cliff said to Stan if you if I pay your fare to come from Brisbane to the Northern Territory I want you to speak be their guest speaker at the AGM of the Northern Territory Cattlemen's Association oh yeah so Stan did line that right up yep and then Cliff got him out on a couple of stations anyway then Stan he was in Alice Springs for a bit and then he came back up through Darwin and Cliff said right you two people are going to meet. So he basically put us into a room in, mm. the, in the office of the <laughs> Northern Territory Cattlemen's Association, mm. introduced us. You can have it out. Shut the door and walked out. Well, walked out and shut the door. Yeah. So Stan and I had a good yarn for you know, a good half a day or more and, and he was fascinating and he started talking about this rubbish, like stuff he'd seen in Alice Springs. He was really excited. He'd seen this animal impact yeah. and how the animal impact was. And I'm thinking, whoa, hang on here. What's this rubbish? Uh, anyway, after that visit, a bloke called Peter Plummer, who was the secretary of the Northern Territory Department, which is the job, he got the job that I'd originally you? applied for. <laughs> he, was, and, um, he was the second best. But he was an ex-school yeah. teacher. Yeah. Uh, and so he had no paradigms. And he came, and by Cliff, because Cliff had organised this again, and he came to me and said, look, I want the industry and our staff exposed more to Stan Parsons. Yeah, cool. But he said, I want you to organise it. And I said, well, I can't. You know, I'm not going to You weren't, you, you weren't really on board. Position. No. With, with he said, I'll tell you what I'll do then. He said, you give me a budget and I will underwrite it. Wow. And uh, so I gave him a budget of flying Stan out here. And then he so we were going to do four one-day workshops, uh, one in Rockhampton, one in Charters Towers, one in Alice Springs, and one in... Uh, Catherine. Anyway, Stan arrived in Australia and the pilot strike hit. So is this 89? 89, late 89 80s. and yeah. the pilot strike was on. Yeah, right. So I had to jump in a, is an aircraft in Darwin and fly to Rocky. Good thing you had your pick him ticket. Up. Yeah, yeah. So I flew down in this little Cessna 210 and uh, arrived in Rocky and we had this one day and I, as a I called Larry Acton, who I knew down here, and Larry was part of um, one of the ag groups. He ended up as heading up Ag Force. And anyway, so Larry used his influence, and he got about 20 people in the room in Rocky to listen to Stan. And then we flew out to Larry's place after that and had a look at Larry's place. And at the end of that first day, Cliff rang me up and said, well, what was he like, you know? Was this worth it? Have we done the right thing? And I said, well, I said, a lot of what he has to say is absolutely brilliant. And I said, that guy is really brilliant. But I said, if only we could shut him up about this stupid cell grazing stuff. <laughs> and uh, I said, he's just talking about it too much, you know. Yeah, and um, right. anyway, then we f- we had problems with the plane leaving Rocky. And uh, problems with the plane every, every leg of the way. Anyway, got to Charters Towers, had more problems with the plane, got them fixed. Then we did a one-day workshop there um, and then flew to Alice Springs from there. And then uh, we did another one in Alice Springs. Um, and the same thing, he just kept talking about this cell grazing stuff. And it was it was a real concern to me. And, um, and then we arrived in Catherine, had more trouble with the plane, and then I th- we were about to fly back to Darwin and I said to uh, Stan, I'd... There's people going back to Darwin by car. Do you want to drive back or come back by plane? He said, oh, I'll go back by car. Turned out to be a good decision. Mm. I landed the plane on the main runway in Darwin and blew a tyre. So that was the end of it. Like it, Things had gone wrong with that plane all the way. Yeah. So I'm stuck on the main runway. There's jets flying around there wanting to land. 
The fireys come out, mm. picked up the plane, dragged it off the runway, gave me a lift back. It was owned by one of the local air traffic controllers. And I just rang him up and said, your plane's off the runway, blown tire, you just go and fix it up, get it, I'm sick of it. Mm. Right? So I'm done. But it, I'm done, yeah. But anyway, we mate, we got around. And, um, and that was the <laughs> beginning. So that was, that was late 89. So he came out first in April 89 and then he came back in October 89. And then um, Pam and I were about to leave the Territory at that stage, so we decided we wanted to come to Rocky. And so we put on a ranching for profit school in Rockhampton in March 1990. So, so Stan was facilitating? He was, the, he was there? He taught it. He taught it. Was it a week? It was a week. So, yeah. so, so the kind of the format that the grazing yeah. for profit and, and grazing and um, farming for profit... Yep. Reasonably similar. Yeah. And 21 or 22 people turned up for that. Yeah. Um, and that said, gee, there's a bit of interest. And that was just out of those first few workshops. And uh, where, where were you with your still grazing mumbo oh, jumbo I by was then? Still concerned. Um, yeah. You know, because remember, I come out of the, the DPI paradigms. And, um, and then we put on a second school that year, 1990, and 30. Two people turned up in Rocky. Yeah, yeah. Thought, Jeez, do you do you do you remember some of the ones that were there? Like, oh, yeah. are they still clients? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Some of the just I tell you what, at Beef Week this week this year, yeah, there was twenty one people at that first course, and there was five of us in the seminar at Beef Week in twenty twenty two. Yeah, wow, well, that's in great, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, little posse. Yeah, so people are still turning up. Raymond Stacey, who works for us yesterday, was at the first seminar, did the first grazing for profit school, really? and then now consults for RCS. You were saying, I can't remember when you told me this, I can't remember it was on, a, on, a, on an interview or we were just having a chat, that you, last year, it was the last year sometime you did a, you were doing grazing for profit and you saw the grand, was it the grandchild Tenth grandchild, tenth grandchild of, of of one of your of your you know like clients that had done the course, graduates, and that for you was like that's signing I'd, off. Yeah, I'd had this little thing in the back of my mind that when I got to teach the tenth grandchild, in other words, I taught the grandparents, the parents, and now the grandchildren, and we've been getting heaps of of second generation through the schools yeah. for quite a number of years, and then and that's been a massive privilege, and then. I had this little thing in the back of my head. When I get to the tenth grandchild, I'll pull up, and I was at the last smoko, in the last afternoon of the school, and I realised that the tenth one was in the room. And I went, I confirmed it. <laughs> what did you say? Did your granddad or grandmother? Yeah, yeah. because I knew that one set of his grandparents hadn't done the school, but I'd forgotten about the other set of grandparents, and it suddenly dawned on me. He said, "Yeah, yeah, they, I'm staying with them in town." And he said, they said to say good day to you. <laughs> anyway, I said, all oh, right, okay. What did that so mean to you then? You, 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 that I, was, I you. finished that school off at half past five or quarter to six that afternoon and I announced at the end of that school that this was my last one. Had you, had you told anyone no, at no, work? Nobody, <laughs> nobody knew. I didn't know. Yeah, right, so I didn't do it. No, it was a last school, no, which is a no. good way to do it. Like, yeah, if I, but the time the time was right. Yeah, the time was right. Um, yeah. Tell me, I'm really interested, Terry. Um, you, so, you know, you you met, and I guess you were kind of <laughs> forced into it by the sounds of it to kind of buddy up with Stan Parsons. Mm. What? Where was Alan Savory in the mix? Was he? Were you not reading his information? You just didn't get to meet him. Like, why did you end up doing the Stan stream, not the Alan stream? Uh, it was coincidental. It was the stream. It, Stan was the guy that Cliff met. Stan was the guy that came out to Australia first. Stan came back again. Stan was prepared to work with us. Um, I knew a bit about Alan at that stage, very little, um, and Stan told me quite a lot about Alan which is all good. Um, Stan was always very complimentary of Alan and always acknowledged Alan at every school Stan ever did. Mm. 
Um, and um, it wasn't until so what happened in that first year, the, towards the end of that first year, there was a senior guy in DPI who used to be a boss of mine caught up with me and he said, look, I hear you're bringing Parsons and Savory to Australia. And I said, well, I'm bringing Parsons out. And he said, we've got a pile of literature three inches deep of all the land that they've destroyed all over the world, wherever they've been. And we see, who, said, who is, sorry, who is this? Who, this was a senior officer in Queensland DPI. Oh, okay, yes. And he said, we're going to run you, we're going to run them out of Australia because we yeah, don't no want good. them doing the damage they've done everywhere else. Wow. And he said, if you stay mixed up with them, you're going to go down with them. Wow. And they tried. Um, they tried very, very hard for 10 years to put me out of business. Um, and very nearly succeeded in the early days. So that would have been in the 90s, was it? In the, was it this that was the first? 1990. Yeah, yep. yeah. Right as we were starting. And um, Gee, That's a bit sinister, isn't it? Uh, yeah, and they tried. And they were publishing stuff where they were actually calling a snake oil salesman, this yeah. is completely wrong, you should not go and do one of these courses. And, you know, I was flat broke at the time, and uh, so I had no resources. And um, one of our clients said, look, I've, I've got a cousin in Rocky who's a solicitor. I'll pay for you. I'll pay his fee if you go along and see him. Tell him what's going on. So I did. I went and saw Andrew, and he said, "Oh yeah." He said, "I'll just write you a letter," and uh, he did. So he wrote me this letter, and I walked into a senior DPI guy's place office one afternoon. I put the letter on the table, and I said, "If if I ever," and I put some of this literature on the table. I said, "If I ever see anything like this in print again, you guys are going to court." And it pulled them up, putting stuff in print. Didn't wow. stop them. White ante. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it was, like a, it was like a cease and desist letter in a way. It, it was, it? yeah. And they stopped. And they actually had a fear for a very long time that that if they overstepped the line anywhere, we were going to be in trouble. Hello. Um, yeah, right. And uh, good. So, yeah. so was that? Did you do you think they kind of? Were they generally concerned and went, oh, we've read this stuff and it's, it's, it's going to ruin it? Or did yeah. they see you, did they kind of see that as a threat, not so much that it was, was literally a, an on-ground ecological threat, but it was more you and bringing this information in was going to give 180 degrees to the paradigm and the DPIs, whatever, whatever charter they were on? Like, you know, was it a genuine concern or was it all like these people are going to make us look bad? I think it was both. I think it, initially it was a genuine concern, but they wouldn't even talk. We tried. We sat down and tried to talk to people um, who were very critical and, and try and just explain what we were doing and what we were saying. Um, and it was – they were just – it was emotional. Like, it was unbelievable. They would just go red and scream. And It really oh, – it was a, an affront. It was an affront, an absolute affront. So – that said to me that it was actually more than just challenging the science. It was actually challenging careers. Yeah. And so if I was right, most of the careers in grassland or rangeland science in Australia were wrong. Well, I mean, there are, there are, there are, I'm not, not naming names, but there are, there are senior, I don't even know what you'd call them. I mean, I guess they're, they're agronomists, I'm going to call them, and generally past agronomists, um, that uh, are still on that page. They I know. still they still fronted. They're still out there. Yeah, um, and I understand it. Like it's about paradigms. If, if you're you've got your career and your life invested in your, you know, your papers and your science and your PhD and whatever else it is, um, then and and you switch that 180 degrees, you you're actually admitting that a lot of that actually wasn't right. But to me, that's that's not science. Like that—that that was the science at the time, and that was testing a particular, mm. you know, theory. Right now, there's a different theory. Um, let's test that. But no, it's like just put the barriers up. You yeah. know, there's no way that can be right because it wasn't as though that old stuff was necessarily wrong. It was, as you say, it was just built on a different it set of principles different and set of objectives, principles, different yeah. paradigms, yeah. and it was obviously right within the paradigms that was done, but not right in terms of new paradigms. Yeah. And But what was happening, which was really fascinating, was the industry was picking it up. The industry got it just like that. Yeah. You know, as you know, when you hear the common sense in some of this stuff, it just makes sense. Pretty compelling. It's compelling. 
Mm. And so you think, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's right, you know. Yeah. Um, but it does smack you, though. Scientists couldn't get it. No. But as a, as a cocky going to grazing for profit in 2005 or whatever it was, like it was, it was, it was confronting definitely. And I know there was people at our course, and you, and you know them, and I, I have to laugh without naming names, but the, the, they were affronted mm. and really challenged. But the wonderful thing was that whilst you were being challenged, you were given an alternative to go to. It wasn't as like, that's all wrong and I'm going to leave you high and dry. There was like, that's not even wrong. That is what we are basing, you know, farmers are basing a lot of stuff on uh, for many years, but th- th- here's a very compelling alternative, which well, is the beauty of it. It's not even that we were actually saying what's happening now is wrong. No. We were just saying, here's a way. There's a, there's a, there's there's a, a way. New, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it was actually the scientific community to a large degree yeah. that made it wrong, that, that yeah. started talking about rights and wrongs. And um, but we never we no. never tried to say that's right and that's wrong. We're saying here's a way that makes sense to us. But what, what, what was inter- evident and interesting and a really good way to put it was it, without, saying, without saying it was wrong, it was, there was a lot of things I remember that came up and I went, oh, my God. Why do I do that? Mm. Like, why do we keep all our, our cows in their separate age groups in different patterns? Yes. That was like, that's a classic, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. like, oh, because Dad did, you know. Yeah. So it wasn't as though there was, yeah, it was wrong. It was more like, it was almost like, why are you so stupid that you do that? You know, not not quite that bad, but but um, so let's jump to, because I'm conscious of the time, um, let, we have, <laughs> we're not even out of the 90s yet. <laughs> what, so... So RCS was born. Well, he was born in 85 uh, in Darwin. And Cliff, again, was instrumental in this. And he said, you've got to go and meet David Hanlon. And so Cliff organised for David and I to meet. And David was an economist. Oh, yeah. um, and I was basically around focused on production. Um, and we thought, well, that would be a nice combination. Mm. Son. Yeah, you're going to be No, no, because I'm, I'm just tracking it. I reckon yeah. if, as it swings down, I'm hoping it's just going to come on the edge of that bit, oh, of, right. bit of greenery there. No, I'm fine. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, so, so I met David and then uh, I thought, well, David seems to know what he's talking about, so we'll just join forces and we'll become resource consulting services. Yeah. Um, that was March 85. Um, and then that contract I got to write up all the material from Mount Bundy um, was... Bundy. RCS's first contract. Ah, I spent that so that was then. official. Yeah, yeah. You're official then. So yeah. um, lots happened. A lot happened in the next ten years. I imagine that's that. So you, you picked up. You became a. Do you become an agent for that for the grazing for profit? How does that work? No. Well, sort of. We basically starved for about well, probably ten years or more, really, from mm. eighty five through to the mid nineties to late nineties, and then. So while we were in Darwin, uh, we were basically working on Aboriginal properties, doing business plans for uh, Indigenous um, properties and a um, little bit of work for some of the corporates on nutrition and things like that. Um, but then I was getting more work back in Queensland. Um, so Pam and I decided that we were going to leave the Territory uh, by the end of uh, 89. And so we did and we headed to Rocky, uh, being the basically the centre of the northern beef industry. Yeah. Um, and we couldn't find any accommodation there, so her sister found us accommodation in Yapoon, so quite by default we ended up in Yapoon. Is that there. right? Um, and so there, that was uh, the end of 89. We arrived in Yapoon. We ran our first school in Yapoon in March 1990. That was really the beginning of the RCS journey as it is. And I guess one of the things that, if I can go back to that mm. mid-80s, the thing that – that gut feel that I had about the losing those per, those desirable perennials, what Stan did for me eventually was make me realise that losing those perennials was actually down to lack of rest. And that was when – when I put those two, two things together, they were, then I knew Stan was on the right track. Um, I was very fortunate, though, that when the DPI threatened me, um, I had to do something. I had to work out really, and I still didn't know in the, in 1990 whether Stan 
was right or whether the DPI was right. So I applied for a Churchill Fellowship and got that in, and went away in 1991 and that was really the turning point because I was then able to study and I went everywhere where Alan Savory and Stan Parsons had ever been. I went to both of their clients. I went right back to their roots in Zimbabwe. I went right back to their roots in South Africa and Namibia. Um, <clears throat> and I got to the bottom of some of the myths. And oh, that was yeah. really important. Yeah. Um, and I started out trying to fault the principles. And I found lots of times where the principles you could fault. Oh, well, I could find faults in management, but I could not fault the principles. And so I realised pretty quickly then on, on very early on the Churchill Fellowship who was right and who was wrong and I had to work out how was I going to handle the opposition because the opposition was not only Queensland DPI but CSIRO every state department of agriculture in Australia was all up at arms against what we were talking about this cell grazing rubbish and um, so what I decided and I can still remember this too sitting in a motel room in Harare waiting for the plane to come back to Perth and then Darwin um, I decided there and then that I, in the future I would only talk to people who wanted to listen and I would never again try to convince people that weren't prepared to listen mm. or weren't prepared to give us hearing and I, I'm not there to convince people who don't want to be convinced I'm there to talk about what I know and that was the breakthrough in me being able to handle that opposition and to this day I stick to that and in next week's episode of The Regenerative Journey, we're going to top you up with part two of that three-hour marathon interview in the, in the uh, Brisbane City Botanic Gardens, uh, where we talked a bit more about what was happening currently. So um, it's a wonderful conclusion to, to, uh, to the, uh, the, what I thought was a ripper, part one. Uh, I trust you enjoy it next week on The Regenerative Journey. This podcast is produced by Rhys Jones at Jaeger Media. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to subscribe, share, rate and review. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au.